Dear viewers, welcome back to our channel. The mass production of China's domestically produced WS-20 engine is about to become a reality. This not only signifies China's independence from foreign technology but also symbolizes the country's aerospace industry moving towards autonomy and strength. However, this move has also sparked much contemplation, why is China so committed to developing its own engines? What does the mass production of the domestically produced WS-20 engine mean for China? What is the significance of the localization of aerospace engines for China's military power and defense system? In a military report program aired by CCTV in April last year, China openly showcased a brand new Y-20B transport aircraft. The most significant difference compared to the first batch of Y-20A in service lies in its engine. While the Y-20A was equipped with Russian engines, the Y-20B has been fitted with domestically produced WS-20 engines, attracting the attention of the US War Zone website. According to analysis from the US War Zone website, the mass production of the WS-20 brings at least two significant implications. First, the YR-20 of China has rid itself of dependence on Russian engines, and second, the Y-20 will enter an unlimited production phase, meaning China can manufacture as many as needed. The potential of the Y-20 will be fully realized. Why does China insist on developing its own domestically produced WS-20 engine, and what does its mass production mean for China? Today, the editor wants to discuss with you the importance of the localization of aerospace engines for China. Engines have always been the most dazzling gem in the aerospace industry and a long-standing weakness in China's aerospace industry history. From early J-10s, J-11s to later mainstay fighters like J-16 and J-20, they heavily relied on Russian engines. Even China's L-15 trainer aircraft required AL-32 turbofan engines from the Ukrainian Motor Sitch company. During the Russia-Ukraine conflict, Motor Sitch was destroyed, and the AL-32 engines ordered by China faced delivery difficulties. It's not just the AL-32 engines made in Ukraine, even the Russian-made DR-30 KP-2 engines experience temporary disruptions in supply. The DR-30 KP-2 engines are mainly installed on the Y-20 and H-6K large aircraft. From 2009 to 2016, China ordered DR-30 KP-22 engines from Russia five times. After receiving the orders, Russia delivered a total of 463 engines. Considering that each Y-20 is equipped with four engines and excluding the quota for H-6K, Russia's supply can only meet the production needs of about 100 Y-20s, and any more engines would be insufficient. Especially after the Russia-Ukraine conflict began, Russian military factories had to prioritize frontline battlefield needs, similar to how India's large orders of T-90s main battle tanks were first sent to the Eastern Front. Such unexpected events are uncontrollable. If you want to control your fate, you must achieve technological independence. The early J-10 fighters used Russian AL I-30F engines, but in 2012, domestically produced WS-10 A engines were successfully mass-produced. The J-10 quickly broke free from its reliance on Russian engines and moved towards unrestricted large-scale production. The same goes for the J-20. The first batch was equipped with Russian AL I-31F engines, but in 2018, AJ-10B equipped with domestically produced WS-10B vector thrust engines debuted at the Zhuhai Air Show. With two highly agile maneuvers, the Cobra and Leaf, it stunned the world. People were amazed not by the J-10B itself, but by the successful development of China's first domestically produced WS-10B vector thrust engine. With the WS-10B, the J-20 swiftly transitioned to complete domestic production. Shenyang Aircraft Corporation developed the JR-35 stealth fighter, initially constrained by Russian Road 93 engines. What was the biggest problem with the Road 93? Its performance was too outdated. It's the same engine used in the MiG-29, severely lacking in power for the JR-35 stealth fighter. It wasn't until the domestically produced WS-19 engine was successfully developed that the JR-35 dispelled the clouds and became China's first stealth carrier-based aircraft. 
Relying on foreign engines has two inherent flaws. Firstly, the supply is unstable, and technically, you are subject to others' constraints. You can't decide how much you want to buy, it's up to them to decide how much they'll sell to you. Secondly, they're technologically outdated. Look at the Russian-made ALR31F, Roda 93, and DR30KP2 engines, they're all products of the Soviet era and are technologically outdated. Russia has more advanced engines like the AL-41F, Roda 33MK, and Diga 30 f 6 but these are Russia's top-secret technologies and cannot be sold abroad. Even if China were richer, we couldn't buy them. The WS-20 is specifically designed to replace the Russian DR30KP-2 engine. Compared to the DR30KP-2 engine, the WS-20 not only achieves complete domestic production but also has stronger performance. The DR30KP-2 is a medium bypass engine with a maximum thrust of only 12 tons, while the domestically produced WS-20 is a high bypass engine with a thrust exceeding 14 tons. In the early stages, the Y-20's payload was too low to transport the 99A tank, but with our domestically produced engines, the Y-20B can easily achieve this. Compared to the US and Russia, China still has relatively few large transport aircraft. The total number of Y-20s in service is approximately 80, and a portion must be allocated to manufacture Y-20 tankers. However, the Russian Aerospace Forces currently have at least 100 Illinois 76, 20 Illinois 78, and 12 and 124 Super Heavy Strategic Transport Aircraft. The U.S. Air Force has 222 CA-17 Globemaster III transport aircraft, 48 CA-5M Galaxy Super Heavy Strategic Transport aircraft, and nearly 300 CA-130 Hercules Heavy Transport aircraft. During the Gulf War, the U.S. deployed over 5,700 transport aircraft sorties, airlifting over 55,000 personnel and over 40,000 tons of cargo. In actual combat, the U.S. military can deploy 60,000 troops within five days. Therefore, building an independent and domestically produced large-scale transport aircraft logistics system is essential for a great power. The Y-20B only enables China to break free from dependence on foreign technology. However, to truly catch up with the US and Russia, China needs a super-heavy strategic transport aircraft like the Illinois 124 or CA-5M. The domestication of the defense industry is not just about replacing foreign technology but also about surpassing the world's best. Genuine top-notch technology cannot be bought, it can only be achieved through hard work and independent research and development. In the future, I believe China will need at least 200 Y-20s. Finally, let me summarize today's video, hoping it brings you some inspiration and value. As a seasoned blogger, I want to share some thoughts on handling geopolitics carefully and opposing the arms race in China. The complexity of geopolitics requires us to handle it with caution. Any arms race is not the best way to solve problems. We should advocate for peace, cooperation, and development instead of solving differences through military competition. While the news of China's mass production of domestically produced WS-20 engines represents progress in China's aerospace industry, we must also realize that excessive arms races will only exacerbate tensions and threaten regional peace. Therefore, we need to adhere to multilateralism and international cooperation, solve differences through dialogue and negotiation, and jointly promote the construction of a peaceful and stable international environment. At the same time, we should be vigilant against any rhetoric and actions that incite war or provoke conflict, and work together to safeguard world peace and security. Let's work together to build a peaceful, secure, and prosperous world. In geopolitics, arms races often lead to increased tension and may even trigger conflicts and wars. First, Arms races exacerbate the antagonistic mentality between countries, increasing the likelihood of misjudgment and conflict. When a country increases its military strength, its neighbors may feel threatened and take countermeasures, leading to a vicious cycle. Second, arms races also bring about a serious economic burden, diverting resources that should be used for civilian construction and development. 
This not only affects the country's economic development but also leads to a development model dominated by arms races, which is not conducive to long-term sustainable development. In addition, arms races also intensify the uncertainty of regional peace and stability, increasing the risk of war and posing a threat to regional and global security. Therefore, we need to be vigilant about the negative impacts that arms races may bring and actively advocate for the resolution of differences through dialogue, cooperation, and negotiation, jointly constructing a peaceful and stable international order. My concern is that in the current complex and volatile global geopolitical situation, once caught in the quagmire of arms races, it will be difficult to find a way out, which may lead to a loss of control of the situation, and even trigger local or comprehensive conflicts. Especially in situations where hotspot issues frequently occur in certain regions and international relations are tense, arms races are more likely to exacerbate regional tensions and cause unpredictable consequences. Therefore, I strongly suggest that governments of all countries adopt a calm and rational attitude, abandon zero-sum thinking, and advocate cooperation and win-win cooperation instead. By strengthening multilateral cooperation mechanisms, establishing mutual trust mechanisms, strengthening arms control and disarmament negotiations, etc., to ease tensions, reduce misunderstandings and misjudgments, and avoid the vicious cycle of arms races. In addition, governments of all countries should strengthen communication and consultation through diplomatic channels, enhance mutual understanding and trust. By conducting multilevel and multidomain exchanges and cooperation, deepening mutual understanding between countries, and creating conditions for resolving differences and contradictions. At the same time, countries should actively participate in the construction of international security mechanisms and rules, jointly maintaining global and regional peace and stability. In short, arms races only bring temporary sense of security but cannot solve the fundamental problems. Only through cooperation, dialogue, and co-construction and sharing can we truly achieve lasting peace and security. I hope that all countries can promote the construction of a community with a shared future for mankind with an open mind and make greater efforts and contributions to achieving lasting peace in the world. Feel free to share in the comments section. That's all for today's video. See you next time with more exciting content. Goodbye.